Hi everyone, I'm your host, Arlen Schumer, and welcome to one of my pop culture presentations. Get ready to be both educated and entertained, what I call edutainment. And when you're done, please be sure to click the subscribe or follow button on your platform screen to be notified of all of my upcoming pop culture presentations. You could say the Marvel superheroes arrived in September of 1966 when they were covered for the first time by a mainstream consumer magazine, Esquire. And you can see by the title, it was addressing the idea that Marvel Comics, unlike their rival, the industry giant DC Comics, were being read by college age readers. And you can see by the signature in the bottom right corner that they got the great Jack Kirby, uh, the prime mover in Marvel Comics in collaboration with Stan Lee to illustrate all the main characters up until the time Kirby probably illustrated this in early 1966, which meant of course that it was too early and there wasn't enough space to include some of his other brand new characters that had only recently appeared on the scene in early 66. Of course, there was the Silver Surfer introduced like so many of Kirby's characters in Marvel's then main uh, flagship title, Fantastic Four. Of course, they finally made a Silver Surfer movie back in 2008, the second of the Fantastic Four films. Also in early 66, you know, comics are dated three to four months in advance of their printed date. So this July issue came out in, uh, you know, April maybe um, of 66, actually six months before the Black Panther organization based in Oakland, California was formed. So maybe they did get their name from Kirby's uh, great black character the first mainstream american blacks uh, actually wasn't he was an american t'challa he was of course an african prince and finally became the blockbuster film with uh its late great actor chadwick boseman of course another of the characters not included in that illustration nick fury agent of shield created by Kirby in 65 to take off of the Connery Bond uh, blockbusters of Goldfinger at the time. Of course, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. made it to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, ran for about, what, seven seasons uh, for the past, you know, seven or eight years ago. There was a spinoff. I think it only ran eight episodes, The Inhumans. By the way, that actor playing Black Bolt is now uh, the actor playing Pike in the new Strange New World Star Trek um, streaming thing on Paramount Plus, which, you know, I'm enjoying. But uh, this version of The Humans, of course, was based on Jack Kirby's 66, uh, introduced, excuse me, in late 1965. Um, just one of Kirby's many Marvel superhero groups of the 60s. Of course, there was 
1963's X-Men. Now, how did one of its kind of lesser group titles in the 1960s when Kirby was doing it? I mean, he only really was involved, I think, maybe in the first 18 issues or so. I'm not really an X-Men expert, pun intended. But how did the X-Men go from this first issue in 1963 to becoming the multimedia franchise that it finally became in the 21st century, really along with the, you know, first two Spider-Man films by Raimi, uh, really kicked off the Marvel universe of movies that have dominated the 21st century. You know, Kirby introduced the Sentinels. Look at, this was 1965. For a couple months, Marvel was calling its comics pop art productions, right? And then there's Kazar, created by Kirby in pages of the X-Men. But, you know, in spite of incredible covers like this, um, colored by Marvel's great colorist, Stan Goldberg. Love the monochromatic red, just gorgeous. Um, but yeah, after Kirby, I think by 1965, left the title to, he was doing layouts at the time, I think by that time for other artists to do tighter pencils over. But, um, you know, the second half of the 60s, the X-Men was reduced to being a Marvel grade C or D title. I mean, they they tried different things. This is December, has to be 1967 maybe. Um, you know, look, they tried making the, the, the villain the main star. I mean, and you can see that the art, you know, while passable, Marvel, I mean, this is penciled by George Tusca, uh, you know, industry journeyman uh, art has been around for decades and everybody was instructed to do their Marvel knockoff style. But by 1968, when the great Jim Steranko was on his meteoric rise, starting in 1967, really, um, the year before, but by 68, when he's doing covers like this, mixing pop art elements that are just blowing people's minds right at the height of, you know, the psychedelic Peter Max kind of movement. Um, the same year, look, this is September of 68, October of 68. What the? Steranko, you know, this industry meteor that the Hendrix of comics was lending his talents to what had been for the past couple of years, a Marvel C title. So not only did he do covers like this, uh, but, you know, he really tried to bring the Steranko touch to only two issues that came out in the summer of 1968, but that included iconic covers like this again you gotta love the monochrome but this is the fall of 68 and by the time we get to the spring of 69 you know the x-men is really on the verge of of cancellation i mean look at this knockoff cover <coughs> of steranko's from six months earlier and then all of a sudden the next month Dated May of 1969, but that means it probably came out in January, uh, February, February, March, April. Yeah, probably February, early March, late February. All of a sudden, we got this issue with this cover. Okay, that looks pretty dynamic, but wow, check out the first splash. We had never seen an X-Men look like this. Reading the credits down below, what do we have? But, okay, Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Tom Palmer, or Uber. But introducing the penciling wizardry of Neil Adams and what wizardry it was. We had never seen an X-Men look like this. And intense 
incredible situations that we're going to look into in this webinar. But it was Neil Adams' version of the X-Men over the next year, working in collaboration with dialogue and caption writer Roy Thomas, created the model of the modern X-Men that six years later, in 1975, would be resuscitated, though they were some of the same X-Men, some of the new characters. Every creative team since this time has done their version of the X-Men inspired by the nine issues that Neil Adams, in a sense, was the auteur of. When John Byrne did, I mean, John Byrne himself was a kind of combination of a little bit of Jack Kirby and a little bit of Neil Adams put together. But, you know, none of this would have been possible without what Neil Adams did in the year 1969 on the X-Men title. And it's this version of the X-Men by the late, great Neil Adams, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. And now we're going to enjoy and look at and revel in his Marvel works. And this is the fifth of a seventh plan webinar, memorial webinar series. My name is Arlen Schumer. Ladies and gentlemen, I did a book on comic book art in the 1960s um, that is called The Silver Age, as opposed to the 1940s, which was the golden age when comics and superheroes started. Um, and it shows how the art reflected what was happening in the decade of the 1960s. And the final chapter is of, on Neil Adams and each artist, I chose a portrait that best represented their art and their maiden iconic characters. And here's a self-portrait of Neil circa 1970. That was for many of us, our very first image of Neil. And it's the image I chose for the series of memorial webinars. I started with an overview. I did the series Dead Man that he made his bones on in 1968. Then his Batman work that began in 68 and ran through 1974, followed by his groundbreaking Green Lantern, Green Arrow series with writer Denny O'Neill, from, ran from 70 to 72. And now his Marvel works that really overlap with his Batman, really, um, just for scheduling reasons, I had to, I originally was going to do Marvel works after Batman. And um, a lot of the source material for this webinar came from my own article slash interview I did with Neil back in 1998, 99, um, for the magazine comic book artist, which began in 1998. So this is only their third issue in 99. Uh, I designed the logo, by the way, for editor and um, John Cook and Tomorrow's Publishing. And they got Neil for this thing called the Marvel Years to do a wraparound cover. That's the front and the back. And here's how it looked as a wraparound. So that's Neil revisiting his art from 30 years prior. If this is 1999, from 1969, that began with this cover. So how did Neil Adams come to do the X-Men? Well, remember I showed you this great shield cover by Jim Steranko. It's really because of Jim Steranko's meteoric rise that preceded Neil's by a year and a half or so, um, doing covers 
and pages that had elements of everything from pop art to op art. I mean, you had to turn the comic book around in a way to read it. I mean, talk about meta. Steranko had it all. He incorporated Kirby's figure style with these kind of Will Eisner slash cinematic storytelling techniques, and then his psychedelic use of color. And I mean, we, if we were kids reading this, we didn't know what color holds were, but Steranko was doing it and using Zipatone and other graphic effects. Well, the same year Steranko was doing this, there's only one other artist in the field of mainstream comic book art that's doing anything close to what Steranko is doing, and that would be Neil Adams. Now, if you squint and look at this effect in the pink panel, it actually spells out, hey, a Jim Steranko effect as the character Dead Man goes deeper into the cave to find the spiritual entity known as Ramakrishna, which gave him the power to live after death to catch his killer. Yeah, Neil's greatest psychedelic page. Um, I, just a masterpiece. And like I said, this came out like six months or so after Steranko did his incredible shield work. So they were really incredible contemporaries. I mean, look at the beautiful woman in the background drawn from Neil's experience with photo reference. And again, six months earlier, um, Steranko did this panel with a similar effect. Now this double page spread comes from the Neil Adams chapter in my book where I compare what Steranko was doing a couple months prior to what Neil Adams was doing in Dead Man. And if we go into the center here, this is Neil talking. When I did the Steranko effect panel in Dead Man, I was tipping my hat to him. I never felt in any way competitive. What Steranko did at the time had almost no relationship to what I did. We weren't trying to do the same thing. I felt we were a community. Like Steranko, I was somebody with a reasonable knowledge of things that were common outside of comic books, suddenly stepping to the field and bam, slapping everybody in the face. Steranko was definitely a graphic illustrator. His goal was to create new and impactful images graphically. He was looking to punch you in the face. That came from Kirby. I was coming from a more traditional background and direction. I tended to do a better drawing. He decried realism except where it related to graphics. Graphics were not my only focus. They weren't his only focus either, but they were certainly overpowering. I was doing many other things, level after level. I was thrilled with the page for the opportunity to experiment, as was Steranko. He was in some ways much more aggressive. He was also very aware of the modern world. His work says, in effect, wake up, everybody. Don't you know we're here? And this is Steranko talking. Neil Adams is doing work that is probably unsurpassable. I'm a great admirer of all of his proceedings. I think Neil's the most talented of the newcomers in the business. Neil did the Ben Casey strip for years and years. So he's got three times as much more drawing time in than I do. But as a comp artist, he's very exciting, doing a lot of imaginative things. So it was... Neil's exposure to what Steranko is doing, where he was telling his story and, in a sense, writing it, and that was called the Marvel style. And, you know, he went to see Stan Lee, probably, right, I would say sometime in maybe late 1968. And um, Stan said, Neil, pick any title, any title you want. And Neil said, well, what's your lowest selling title? And Stan was like, well, why would you want that? And Neil said, well, because, you know, you let me alone to do it where you don't really care 
uh, especially if it's on the verge of cancellation, like what, the X-Men? And Stan said, okay, you know, we're thinking of canceling it. We'll let you do a couple of issues. But Neil, you have to promise me that after you do X-Men, you will do a more popular title for us like the Avengers. And that's how Neil Adams came to do X-Men. Look at how he's built here in this 1969 photo feature as X-Men artist extraordinary. This ran in the, I think the summer 69 annuals. And yeah, you can see some late great people there as well. Notice how right underneath Jim Steranko, Caliph of Creativity, we have Roy Thomas, Stan's good left arm. Roy Thomas in late 68 was not only Stan's right-hand man, but he was really the first um, sort of fan, a fan of comic books in the early 60s to become a professional. This is a 1964 article, maybe. Um, I don't have the exact year, but there's Roy Thomas, teaches English literature for a living and publishes a magazine that was alter ego, of course, about comic books for a hobby. So, yeah, but by 69, Roy is the younger protege of Stan Lee and is considered the best writer at Marvel Comics other than Stan Lee. And he happened to be writing the X-Men title at the time. And again, they were gonna cancel it and he didn't really know what to do with it. And when he heard that Neil wanted to do the X-Men, I mean, he admired like all the Marvel people, the only title they read was Dead Man. And that's how Roy Thomas I mean, Neil requested Roy Thomas because he knew he was Marvel's best writer. Now, I'm showing you this page of the great photos to show you Tom Palmer, Inker Incredible. The only way Neil at that time, he was the most in-demand artist in comics by, by late 68 after his run on Dead Man blew people's minds. And Tom Palmer had just recently, uh, in 68 as well, come from a stretch of being, in the end, Neil, Gene Colan's soulmate anchor, starting on in 1968 on Doctor Strange. I mean, the Colan Palmer Doctor Strange, also with Roy Thomas as writer, is really the only version of Doctor Strange after Steve Ditko's original that can stand on the same um, comic book legacy platform. So. In May of 69, which means it came out in February or so, you had Neil's first X-Men. And yet, this cover was not Neil's original cover. This was the original cover. Yeah, do you believe it? I mean, check out that logo. How great is that logo? And I mean this almost three-dimensional guy in the tube coming at us. You know, this is May of 69, a year earlier. I think this is April of 68. No, this might also be in 69. Yes, this is April of 69, only a month earlier. He's also doing a guy in a tube coming at you. So it's interesting, but this cover was rejected by publisher Martin Goodman, I believe, if not Stan Lee as well, if not Stan Lee first, they thought it obscured the logo, thereby preventing sales. And I think Neil argued for it, but this would be not only Neil's first Marvel cover, but it would be as you're gonna see as we move through his Marvel years, an omen a harbinger of not such good things to come in terms of covers. Because from the get-go, his cover was rejected and became this. 
Now I'm showing you this black and white version because look closely at the face of the villain. And even this version was modified to look like that. So like we're gonna see in other covers compared to the covers I've shown you of his DC work and the ones I'll show you in the final webinar called Adam's Eclectica, the X-Men covers are not what Neil's greatest Marvel works are about. It's about his interiors. And basically, Neil inherited this Roy Thomas plot that had petered out in the previous issues because Thomas knew they were gonna discontinue the title. So these, what you're gonna see is not only Neil's penciling, Tom Palmer's inking, but these are Neil's stories that he drew out first, just like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and all the Marvel style artists. He would draw the stories out with margin notes for Roy Thomas to come in a la Stan Lee with Jack Kirby and Ditko and his other artists and put in the dialogue and narration. But as you see from these great Egyptian settings, Neil's mastery of photo reference, of course, you can begin to see the graphic sophistication of what would become his signature X-Men works. Look at the effects in the top panel, the zip tone of the ghostly figure in the first panel. And in the background, the purple and blue face, the, the Egyptian, the accuracy, you feel like you're there. Look at the beautiful coloring down. Oh, by the way, and Neil, I think Tom Palmer colored these X-Men, Neil colored some. Both of them were, were and are, if they never, if Tom Palmer never inked anything and was purely a colorist, and if Neil Adams never penciled or inked or, or anything and just as colorists, both Adams and Palmer were masters. So, I mean, look at the issue before Neil took over X-Men. This is Werner Roth, I believe, inked by Vince Coletta, maybe, I'm not sure. But, you know, yeah, you got a diagonal panel, but look at the difference Neil Adams makes just in terms of the dimensional quality of his work, his mastery of anatomy and foreshortening, real human expressions, dramatic lighting. All of these elements would be in play immediately in his X-Men works. And we would start to see the same types of kind of psychedelic effects that we had seen in his Dead Man work and in Steranko's work of, of the year before. And the dynamism of Neil Adams' work, his layouts, I mean, the drama of Neil's work in the very same issue, Neil Adams did, I think, his first X-Men was a 15-page story. And there was a 10 page backup by Werner Roth. And that's what comic book art, you know, average comic book art looked like before Neil Adams. And if you can just get a sense of the drama of Neil's work, the realism, yet the dynamism at the same time. What Neil basically was trying to do with the X-Men, I'm gonna quote you from my interview with him. He said, what I did was make the world of the X-Men more complicated, build one thing on top of the other, integrate one thing into the other so that after a while, you get a whole world populated by these characters, all integrated so that you started to see a tapestry of characters, all having these different interrelationships. I don't think the X-Men ever should have been a story and then a story and then a story. It should be the tapestry that goes on. And you can see the dynamism of Neil's layout, starting with the second issue's splash page. 
and the realism of the characters and the human expressions. Look at the, some of these scans you're seeing, they're not the highest resolution, but they're the best things that exist because so much of Neil's original art, inked by Tom Palmer here, was stolen, lost, doesn't exist, and whatever exists through the internet that I could find, things that have been in my files for decades, I'm going to show you tonight. But you can see how much great coloring adds to black and white comic art. And Neil's pacing of these stories, they feel like, I know it's a cliche, but when I say movies on paper, you can see, by the way, the depths of the, I mean, look at all that's going on in this one page. You get the realism of human expressions, the change in lighting, the middle panel with the blue light of a television screen, the television screen image, which is relating information, which we're going to talk about. Neil's color hold in the bottom left panel. Um, just almost every page startling us with the dynamism of the layout and Tom Palmer's inks, the use of Zipatone and the third panel and Neil's patented shiny black ink effect on the X-Men's dark blue costumes, um, which was his patented style that Tom Palmer inked so accurately. And then we get to this famous page in which for years, a comic book art aficionado has been discussing, is this a great example of comic book storytelling on a page or is it not? First of all, let's take a look at the page in pure black and white. And you can just see Tom Palmer's fine line inks. Now we don't have examples of Neil's tight pencils. Nobody kept Xeroxes in those days. And, uh, you know, again, you know, it's a shame that all, all, all that exists are pretty much what I'm showing you. But I just think this is just a, a brilliant artist at the height of his game. Like all brilliant geniuses in their field, they take chances, they experiment, they, they have the right stuff. They push the outside of the envelope. Neil has said in later interviews um, that if he were to do this page again, he would reverse it. Now, Neil didn't put this together. I think the artist Joe Jusco did, but it kind of gets across, I think, what Neil was more or less saying. So <clears throat> this was 1969. I think this book came out a couple of years ago. Graphic Design Strategies of the World's Greatest Comics Company. And what do we have in the middle on the structure of storytelling? Carl Potts uh, worked with Neil Adams at Continuity Associates before he became an esteemed comic book uh, a veteran uh, as an editor, as a uh, artist on so many levels. But you can see uh, the prominence of this page decades later. Then comes this cover, Neil's third. And this is the one that if you were already reading uh, Neil's Dead Man the previous year, it immediately re recalled Neil's dramatic color hole. January 68, again, this came out in the late fall of 1967. I remember staring at that face of Dead Man in the background for hours wondering how it got there, basically. But by 1969, Neil brought that to Marvel Comics. Look at what it looked like in black and white. You can see the whiteout that Tom Palmer used when he inked it. 
I'm assuming Palmer Inc. Neil usually inked his own covers, but I, I guess Palmer, you know, I'm not really sure whether Palmer inked the covers as well. But there it is, full screen. How about this dramatic splash page? Which here's a version of Tom Palmer's black and white inks. The use of Zipatone to give the Sentinels a further dimensional dramatic look. And back to its color printed version. And then you had one of Neil's great double page spreads. So many things to enjoy on the spread. I mean, where to begin? First of all, let's see it as Tom Palmer saw it when he inked it. Just beautiful, tight inks. The use of, again, of Zipatone, the television screen images. Ah, as they're relating the narrative. Hmm, where did that come from? Was Neil the first to do that? Well, earlier that year, the same month that Neil started on X-Men, it was Steranko's third in his trilogy of definitive Captain America stories um, that redefined the character uh, after Kirby's departure on it. Not only under this great cover was this great splash page. This might be the first, I got to check to see if Will Eisner back in the 40s with the spirit did anything with a TV screen like this. But this in the modern era, because, you know, you jump ahead from early 69 to 1986 and Frank Miller's landmark Dark Knight Returns, which... Whoops, let's get back to that. Um, its entire narrative style from the get-go was Miller using the TV screen image to relate the narrative, as you can see on this double-page spread. But I've got to believe, since Adams was such an influence on Miller, that the TV screen images from this... X-Men series were just one of the standout um, elements of the incredible artwork and storytelling by Neil Adams. I mean, look at these layouts. You know, it's angular to get across the dynamism of the art, and yet it is still clearly telling the story. I mean, your eye is still starting upper left, moving across, down to the left in the kind of Z formation. Now, why am I showing you the cover of the Neil Adams sketchbook that I edited and designed and was published by Vanguard in 1999? Well, underneath its cover, one of its pages, and all the text on the right is Neil Adams talking about these sketches. And I'm merely the editor, but believe me, my editing is on every line of that text. But that's Neil. I mean, the sketchbook is a primer on the art of sketching itself. But you can hear, you can see in the italic caption below, if you've been reading while I've been talking, that, you know, Neil felt at the end to some extent, the sketch is more successful than the finished piece. The blockiness is there more in the sketch than it is in the finished piece. And that is the um, beauty and the burden of doing a great sketch that has that raw power and emotion and your job bringing it to finish. And this goes for all art. That's the trick, is how do you maintain that initial gestural, inspirational, the sum of all your instincts is what an artist puts on paper every time he goes to create or on a screen or a canvas. But it's still not bad in the finished art. Now, this is again, you know, mid-1969, this is the same time 
Neil, the most in-demand artist in comics, is doing the Batman team of comic Brave and Bold with great stories like this with the new Green Arrow. But this is, you know, Neil using the same dynamic angular layouts over in Brave and Bold as he is with the X-Men. I mean, look at this incredible sequence with the beast <coughs> that shows Neil's mastery of emotion, uh, of motion and figure dynamics. And not many artists would draw a figure from behind and underneath <coughs> and draw a man's giant foot. <coughs> Excuse me, unless you have a command of anatomy as Neil Adams did. And just his facility with human emotion and expressions based on his years working with photo reference resulted in art like that and gestural sketches like this. If you're an Adams aficionado, you know that you can recognize roughly the era that Neil did the sketch based on his signature. So this is definitely late 60s, early 70s Neil Adams, but that's the beast. Ah, so who is this character introduced from that dramatic cover? But yeah, don't you love the sketch? That's the character Havoc. And it immediately demonstrates Neil's mastery of costume design because in today's world of computer graphics, the idea that his costume, his figure is actually a black three-dimensional void that that energy circle is operating in. It was never meant to be a flat graphic kind of printed on his chest. Neil is already this visionary graphic artist thinking, you know, decades ahead of the computer of how nowadays that idea that Havoc's black figure space is actually a three-dimensional void that you know, this sphere of energy would be the same no matter where you went around the figure, but only Neil's mastery of anatomy would enable him to draw the figures so that you could see the way he's moving by Neil's mastery of the silhouette. And then, of course, we get to see for the first time the way Neil envisioned this ball of energy in the center of his figure emanating out from under, you turn the page. And again, this is Neil incorporating the dynamics of Kirby with his realism and being able to ride the line between the two and tell a story with dynamics. Havoc became one of his most requested convention sketches. I love this one because I, I tuned it in Photoshop so that you can still see the kind of magic marker fill-in that Neil did for the black silhouette of the figure. How about this early 70s, late 60s sketch of Cyclops? There's, again, Neil, just a master of the human figure, of anatomy, knowing where to put the black spaces on a shiny costume, lighting, dynamics. So much energy and beauty in these raw sketches and Cyclops. Yeah, kind of the coolest character, the X-Men. And you can see how Neil incorporated that into this might be one of his best X-Men covers because it's not so crowded by all the trade dress as so many of his later Marvel covers would be crowded in as we get into the early 70s. This is still 1969. But this great cover, by the way, you just got to stare. We were all staring at the way Neil spotted Blacks in the highlights of the X-Men's uniforms. And that just became a defining look for Neil Adams. 
and so many anchors to follow, you know, learn by staring at figures like that. And this ink by Tom Palmer, I mean, look at this page, how it started. We don't have the thumbnail sketch. We only have the ink here. But look how much of a difference it makes when you take away all of Sam Rosen's great lettering. This is basically what Tom Palmer inked. And then it was given back to Sam Rosen and the Marvel production department. And they added all of that and decided to crop it, et cetera. But still with the color added by Palmer or Adams, you get one of the great X-Men splash pages. This is the issue that has that great panel of Cyclops that I used as the promo image for this webinar. And it comes from this great X-Men action page. Again, Neil drawing the bottom of the beast's foot as well as the Sentinel's feet. Great. Neil knows his physics and the way human figures move when they're doing gymnastic feats like the, what the beast is doing in the great center panel. And man, tension and release is what art is all about. And that's what you get in that bottom panel. And then this incredible climax where, you know, folks, I'm not really talking about the stories as much. This webinar is really a visual webinar showing you, you know, the incredible artwork. We don't have time to really discuss what the stories are about. But suffice it to say, if you read in the dialogue, the Sentinels must seek out the source of mutant-inducing radiation. Though our quest lead us to the most inaccessible place of all, to the very heart of the raging sun itself. And how about this as just a pure piece of comic artwork that makes you feel like you really are watching a movie. And Neil said of Roy Thomas's writing, Roy crafted the flow of words so that they blew apart everything that had been done with group superheroes right up to that day. And he especially pointed out this particular great caption. The next intro introduced another of Neil's creations, Sauron. We're going to have a closer look at him. But how about this double page spread? Again, exhibiting so many trademark Neil touches, the great facial close-up in the upper right panel with the dramatic lighting. Neil's courageous spotting of blacks. You know, folks, when you commit that much black to a, a human figure, you better know your anatomy and know your lighting. And Neil always pulled it off. And then you get Neil's great vehicle design, which look three-dimensional. I like the way he breaks the picture plane on the right with the nose of the great vehicle that he creates. This issue contained his idea of a new angel outfit. I think the angel being the most sort of superhero-ish, the ability to fly and the wings had to be, you know, every artist's kind of favorite character maybe or one of the favorite characters to do. But of course, it is Angel who encounters Sauron, which initially started out, Neil said, to try to do the vampire theme at a time when, according to the comics code, you couldn't have vampires and sucking blood. So instead, Neil came up with Sauron, who can, instead of sucking blood, suck the energy out from you, especially mutant energy. And there's one of Neil's great realistic close-ups. You know, the more you look at this art, you can see that it's not just a matter. I mean, there's not necessarily a photograph of a guy that looks like this that Neil just, quote, trace. This is a combination of realism and exaggeration, realism and cartooning in order to achieve this type of effect. 
uh, the next issue. You know, Neil's ability with realism to use photographs and base them on realistic locations. Isn't that when you're heading from, is it from San Francisco to Oakland or is it the Seattle? I feel like I've seen this on the West Coast somewhere. I'm not sure where that is or Portland maybe, or I forget where the story takes place. But here's a great splash page of Sauron looking, coming right at you. Again, Neil's mastery of realism combined with um, dramatic foreshortening and exaggeration. How about this double page spread? Really gets across the airiness of the effect, the storytelling effect. Would you believe that, I think there might've been a page in between, but Neil follows up this double page spread with an even greater one I mean, just one of Neil's, again, great artists take chances. You can't do this all the time. But if you're going to do it, you better pull it off. And I think Neil pulls it off. You see, Neil's mastery of realism extended to animals and, and monsters and reptiles. I mean, you know... It, 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 there's a realism to Sauron's facial expressions. I mean, look at this one on the next page. Not many artists would dare to draw a close-up like that of a reptilian, bird-like, whatever you want to call Sauron, uh, is, and again, pull it off. But Neil had that same facility, of course, with his human faces. So that with his combination realism and exaggeration, you felt these intense emotions. Or on a really simple but beautiful page, I mean, Neil's use of white space to give this page its airy feel. But again, your eye goes right to this incredibly dramatic face. And let's look at it in its Tom Palmer inked black and white and that fine line work with his pen and the use of Zipitone and then the sensitive, subtle coloring. I mean, folks, there's a lot of tones going on there. And this is old school Benday dot color. But you got to love it, right? This issue is one of Neil's artistic highlights of the X-Men run. He must have really loved Kirby's Kazar that I showed you earlier, circa 1964. But here we are, summer of 1969. And again, whether Neil or Tom Palmer inked this cover, it just shows you the beauty and the subtlety of those pen lines. And again, the dramatic use of Zipitone for that dimensional effect. Another great dramatic splash page. Look how it looks in an approximation of Palmer's pen and ink inking. And again, how much good coloring brings to a great scene. This is just, again, this, the use of diagonal panels works if the action within them is enhanced by the dynamism of a diagonal. A great storyteller knows when to use it. And the coloring, whether it's by Palmer or by Adams, Look at what I'm showing you now is the color guide. That is a black and white photo set with colored dyes, like watercolor dyes applied to them. And if you notice, there's notations, B3R2. That means that the people that are cutting the screens, the Bende dot screens for solids and gradations, are following these hand-painted photostats 
again, either by Palmer or by Adams, of how they wanted the different colors. And those B means blue mixed with Y, yellow for green. And it's all following a chart of like 36 colors. And that's how pages like this would end up being printed on newsprint. All I did was make the whites white and the blacks black, like the original colorist was seeing it on those black and white photostats. And then as Neil tells the story, you go into this kind of psychedelic looking dreamy effect and Neil uses this, I guess could be called the clear line technique of drawing, which lets you know you're in this other dimension. Um, now this look, the clear line style, at the time in the late 60s was very popular. This is probably Neil's biggest influence, the science fiction artist Mike Hinge, who during the 1970s worked at Continuity um, for a couple of years there. Uh, but for a time, Hinge was doing, you know, paperback covers like this. I mean, Time Magazine, November of 69, right around the time of Neil's X-Men, uh, whether this is Milton Glaser or a Milton Glaser knockoff from the New York City-based Pushpin Graphics, the age of Aquarius, again, that's either Milton Glaser or a Milton Glaser knockoff. But so many great illustrators at the time, like the great Bob Peake, were using this kind of line style with what at the time were being called psychedelic colors. And Neil would employ this effect in his X-Men work, as in this page with some more great diagonals. And there's Palmer's black and white inked approximation. Back to the X-Men story with the angel. But you can see how it looks in black and white as Tom Palmer inked it according to Neil's instructions. The color guide for this page, either by Palmer or by Neil Adams, just really, you can see the amount of hard work that went into these pages. And again, it's not like they were being uh, financially remunerated uh, at, a, at as high a level as this art is calling for, but that's another story. But there's the finished printed page. Nice close-ups of the X-Men here. And you get, again, only Neil Adams would draw a figure like Cyclops in the center and pull it off because of his mastery of anatomy. But yeah, that feels like action. How about this classic? shot of Kazar at the top of the page with the X-Men right behind. Neil could draw animals as well. Palmer's inks. Again, these aren't the best resolution images. These are the best I could find. So when I say an approximation of the black and white original art, it's what I'm giving you. But here's the color guide just for that panel. And I mean, that's a lot of work for one panel, but that shows you the dedication to the final printed panel that looked like this. Give me this old school Bende dot coloring anytime if you've got colorists like Tom Palmer and Neil Adams doing great pages that look like this. So during the mayhem, there is a... Listen, X-Men, Kazar says to those fluted strange from nearby. I have never seen their maker, but whisper tales call him the piper. When he makes music, death and destruction are his dread refrain. Well, a page or two later, we get this great sequence. Again, folks, when people talk about comics as film on paper, it's stuff like this they're talking about. You feel like you're watching frames of film. 
But remember, it's just lines on paper. They began with lines like this. This is Neil's thumbnail sketch. Literally, that might be one inch tall. Uh, I've blown it up to be the size of the panel you're looking at. And even though it's very, you know, it's as best as I can render it, you know, in Photoshop, it still looks very, you know, degenerated. But you can see how this, the gesture was maintained by Neil and Tom Palmer in the finished art. Only Neil would be able to pull off a panel like the far right. Again, no dialogue or captions necessary. Neil doesn't have to show you the punch. You've seen great punches. He, he has the confidence to show you after the punch. Perhaps one of Neil's most dramatic, greatest full page images I always imagine this the size of a wall of a museum. If I ever get to design a Neil Adams exhibit, that's one of his great full page images of a character he introduces in the middle of this particular great issue. How about Tom Palmer's inks? The cross hatching, you know, yeah, there's some zipper tone in there, but that's, you know, second to Neil Inking himself. It's Tom Palmer as his soulmate inker. And it's like each page was just a visual ecstasy. I mean, page 13, you got this incredible page with that incredibly realistic yet dramatic and the lighting and the coloring of that panel, the facial close-up down below. Now, this was one of the few pages we have that exist in what looked like Neil's tight pencils, not thumbnails. This is one of the only pages that exists of what Tom Palmer was given. Now, Neil's thumbnails were so tight, this could have been a half-size pencil. I'm not sure, but the bottom line is Neil didn't keep Xeroxes, Palmer did, and he inked directly on Neil's pencils. So all we have, and this is the best black and white approximation, it's a low res version roughly of Tom Palmer's inks. But again, you can see what great coloring adds to great drawing. And then Neil obviously wasn't satisfied with his angel costume of two issues ago, so he gives us this brand new angel outfit that this character creates for him when he brings him back literally from the dead. I happen to think this is the great angel costume. It's really just, to me, one of Neil's perfect timeless outfits. It works on any direction and any level. And, you know, to me, it's just the perfect angel. And this is just an example of Neil's dramatic storytelling. Remember, Roy Thomas is writing the dialogue to Neil's story. So as you follow it along, then he does not suspect creator. No amphibious, but then why should he? The angel's never seen me before, except in my all conquering colors. Perhaps it's true what they say. Perhaps clothes do make the man. Ah, so that is Neil again bringing back what Kirby had done six years earlier in 1963. Marvel had killed off Magneto. So Neil figured out a way to bring him back. The next issue has this great dramatic splash page. Again, just trademark Neil Adams. You've got the facial expression, the low angle view, you know, the, the, the dramatic use of zipper tone to get across the video screen. Just the, 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 the design and dynamics. And it would carry over into pages like this. And there's that realism and the subtlety of Palmer's inks 
that even on this low-res black and white version, you can still get a sense of and the color work. Ah, how about this stylized fight scene? I mean, nobody would have the balls to simplify a fight scene like this. And, you know, you can quibble with the choice of colors. Again, here's Neil's thumbnail. Folks, this is half the size of an 8.5 by 11. Like, this is one quarter of an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. <coughs> In other words, that's not an 8.5 by 11 sketch. That is a quarter of an 8.5 by 11 page. But you can see how those initial gestures wound up in the finished art. And, you know, on a page like this, your eye would just zero in on these faces of Neil's that this is what Roy Thomas wrote his dialogue to that Neil praised. But this is what Roy had to work with. This Magneto saga ends with a trademark dramatic perspective of Magneto's hand bursting out of the panel borders for dimensional effect. You turn the page and you can see it looks like he gets crushed by the falling machinery. But the story ends on a pretty interesting note where Cyclops is saying, as mutants, they'd have been mere outcasts of a society that hated them. They'll be happier when they're back to normal. And Kazar says, will they? Who could be happier to lose vast powers which set them apart from other men? Did you say who? Offhand, Kazar? I could think of at least five people without even trying. Now, I think this is an example of Roy Thomas overriding when he adds in their initials, General Manor, the X-Men. You know, I think we knew who Cyclops meant. So I think that's a case where I think Roy overwrote. But hey, that's just me. So that was issue 63. Issue 64 was a fill-in reprint. Neil returns with issue 65. But that's not a Neil Adams cover. That's Marie Severin. But some of the figures, could those have been originally Neil? We'll never know. But what this story is about, not only does it bring back havoc, but as Cyclops says, hey, Jeannie, why the tears? I understand now. I can stop pretending. These past months, it's, it's been so hard. Yes, Neil Adams reintroduces Professor X. Now, if you're a reader or a fan of the modern X-Men, you think Ms. Professor X has been there all along. But nope. Just like they killed off Magneto and Neil brought Magneto back to life, you can see in the caption box by Stentorian Stan that Issues before, 42, they had actually killed, I mean, you know, Neil, in a sense, resuscitated Professor X so that he could take part in an incredible sequence that if you're a fan of the modern X-Men, you know that this type of activity where they become the unimind by linking minds is what Neil brought to the X-Men in incredible pages like this. Again, Neil's mastery of the human figure in all races, ages, genders, nationalities, ethnicities. Anyway, by unifying all the minds, they're able to stave off the alien attackers and they return to their, uh, their the Xenox, whatever. And you can see that it saves the day. And I think this is a panel fitting to end on Neil's nine issue X-Men run. 
when he's got Professor X saying, go and God bless. Again, everything the modern X-Men are about all comes out of what Neil Adams did in those nine issues in 69. As soon as they were over, back at DC, Neil's hooked up with their version of Roy Thomas, Denny O'Neill, also a journalist and a teacher like Roy Thomas. He was the youngest, hippest writer that DC Comics had. So Neil, as he himself said, was blessed with working with really the two top writers of the late 60s, early 70s, and that was Denny O'Neill at DC. So starting in the fall of 69, they embarked on a series of solo Batman stories that would run for the next four years or so. And then hot on the heels of that, in the spring of 70, would be their run on Green Lantern, Green Arrow, that I did a memorial webinar on last week. So as big as these things were at D.C. at the time, they were the two best things happening at D.C. Um, versus what was happening with Steranko and Kirby and Busima and Gene Colan and Romita and everybody at Marvel. But this is April of 1970. The other big thing that would happen at D.C. was hinted at by house ads like this, that the great one is coming. In 1970, who was the great one? Of course, that was Jack Kirby leaving Marvel in 1970 to come to DC with what would become known as the fourth world of titles, four interlocking titles, the first two to be released. Well, actually not the first two, but there is the keynote title on the right, The New Gods. Everybody remembers this cover, dated March of 71. It came out in, like I said, December of 70, I believe. But it was the mezzotint effect in the background, and that's a printer's term for the type of screen that I think Urban Legend has it, Neil Adams added that to Kirby's original figure to give... Kirby's New Gods debut cover, a special dramatic fact. Neil was doing covers with Mesotins over at DC since 1968, 69. I think this is December of 70, maybe, this cover. So might have a little earlier than what he did. But with Kirby leaving Marvel and going to DC, that left so many of his Marvel titles he was full-time on Captain America and Thor and Fantastic Four, and that left them without artists. So Neil, after his X-Men run, went to Stan Lee and said, you know what I'd love to draw, Stan? Let me draw a couple issues of Thor just to get it out of my system. And there's his first Thor cover, inked, as you can see by the signature at top, by Joe Sinnott. Jack Kirby's great anchor. Now, this looks as much like Neil Adams as it looks like Jack Kirby, but it's really, according to Neil, it's Neil doing more John Buscema's version of Thor than it's Neil doing Kirby's. But suffice to say, it was an interesting experiment. I personally don't like the mixture of Sinnott, and I, I love Joe Sinnott on Kirby, but... According to Neil, yeah, I mean, look at this cover. It's Neil doing his more realistic take on Kirby's godlike characters, which were drawn larger than life. And somehow Neil's realism, I mean, to me, it's a hippie with a helmet. But, you know, to each his own. But we're still debating uh, decades later on whether you like but Neil's layouts, everything he did, and again, these are Neil's stories that Stan Lee put the dialogue in. Now, I apologize for this poor color reprint. It's all I was able to find on the internet, but I'm showing you this particular page because it's one of the few examples we have of the best reproduction of what looked like Neil's 
these look like Neil's tight pencils that sin it ink, but you know, again, Neil's smaller thumbnail layouts were super tight, but these have to be, and then sin it in a sense, embellish them. Again, this is the best example of resolution of what sin it inks look like before the finished coloring was put in. So Neil tried to do his approximation of Kirby's, you know, the regal majesty of Kirby's Thor, but it was tough to measure up to what Kirby had already done. His second issue, this is an aborted Neil cover that either Neil rejected, Stan Lee rejected, who knows, but the finished cover, some databases credited to Neil Adams and Busima and Marie Severin, maybe doing the layout, it's really a hodgepodge. And again, with Senate inking, you be the judge. But man, there were some crazy pages. It's like, it's Neil, but it's not Neil. It's Senate. But, you know, your mileage may vary, as the kids say. His final page kind of ends with Neil doing his great homage to Kirby's, you know, sort of stock transformation pose, as you can see here in reverse, uh, inked by, by the way, Bill Everett. Another of Kirby's titles that he left when he went to DC, he had been doing a series of 10 page and human stories that were inked by his old inker Chick Stone. They were in a team title, not a team title, a split title, sharing it with a Black Widow called Amazing Adventures. So this is January 71. It's Kirby's fourth and last in humans. You can see that maybe he had a hand in drawing some of the bottom, but that looks like a Marie Severin cover. But bottom line is Roy Thomas said to Neil after he had finished the Thor issues, what do you want to do next? And... Roy Thomas offered the Inhumans, and again, Neil loved Kirby's original Inhumans. So that's not a Neil cover. That's another Marie Severin mixed with, I don't know, a little Busima. But ah, the splash page is another thing. Yep, there it is. A dramatic introduction of Neil Adams reunited with Tom Palmer, his X-Men anchor. How about the black and white art? Take a time to just study the notes, the slick inking. You know, this is Kirby's pencil of uh, X of a black bolt that was used for the cover of the first Marvel Mania magazine in 1970, but you can see that Neil is trying to take the dynamics of Kirby, but meld it with his realism and his foreshortening. And that's how you get this dramatic splash page. And there's a single page of just Neil doing Black Bolt. Like you can see the love and the inking by Palmer. I mean, the use of the photographic city, I mean, that feels so dimensional. And once again, only Neil would have the command of anatomy to draw a man's backside and nowhere to put all those highlights and Palmer inking it. And again, the simplicity, the, you know, the blue and the yellow, the, the simplicity of the color. Here's a page with uh, some interaction. I'm only showing you this particular page and I'm highlighting this particular panel because we happen to have a tiny thumbnail. Again, I had to blow it up. It looks a little digitized, but that is maybe a one inch square that I'm showing you. But you can see that even in that one inch square, how it ends up as that piece of finished artwork. Some nice action and drama 
again, it's a page we happen to have the black and white version of. So you can see Palmer's tight inks. And this particular story ends with one of Neil's great close-ups of Black Bolt without his mask. That's just patented shading by Neil, the daring to commit that much black ink to the center of a man's face. You've got to really know what you're doing. Next issue, Neil's third. You know, these covers, they're not Neil's greatest, but that's because, you know, he was hamstrung. These are Maurice Severin layouts, and Neil basically had to follow them. That's the way Marvel worked. It wasn't like DC where he had free reign to do whatever he wanted. And look at how much type ends up crowding in in these early 1970s covers. And then what? No Tom Palmer. Okay, now that's a pretty dramatic splash, but the inking looks a little heavy-handed after Palmer. That's because it's by John Verporten. Now, Verporten had been a kind of a, you know, old-school mainstay artist in the production department, inker, production department guy. But to me, as you can see on some of these pages, you, you can only wonder what these pencils must have looked like and what Tom Palmer might have done with them. But, you know, one of the ways you can really see the difference in what I believe is for Porton's heavy handedness is when you look at a close up like this and you can reduce it to black and white as for Porton inked it. And then you compare it to the great Tom Palmer inked close up. This happens to come from my Marvel Years article slash interview with Neil. Now, the irony is that for Porton was one of Jack Kirby's best inkers. He only inked four issues of his Eternals when Kirby returned to Marvel in 1975. This is from July of 76, the first issue of the Eternals. But man, some of these double page spreads, I mean, that's as great as anything Senate inked. These are some of Kirby's definitive eternal spreads, and they're all inked by Verporten. So, you know, Verporten and his bold inks, you know, brush-oriented, great for Kirby. Not so great for Neil Adams. This particular sequence ends with Black Bolt using his vocal power you know that a mere whisper can bring on the next page devastation. Once again, you can only imagine how Tom Palmer might have inked this. And uh, nevertheless, it just shows Neil's power of dramatic, realistic, yet stylized, exaggerated drawing. Now, what's this? Neil's third issue, burn, black bull, burn. Okay, well, let's see. Another important inked issue. Once again, it looks like a beautiful pencil drawing that we can only imagine what Tom Palmer might have done with this. But there's a nice page of X-Men action. Very hard to draw hair as an action element, but Neil again pulls it off with Medusa. I like the fact that in the upper left panel, Karnak, Neil's mastery, you don't have to see the punch to feel it. If you know how to draw and add force lines and motion lines, that's called cartooning, baby. But this story had a black militant as its, you know, anti-hero slash villain. And you can read by the dialogue, you know, folks, this is 1971. This is post-civil rights movement, post-Martin Luther King getting assassinated in 68. The era of the black exploitation film had begun in 1970, the year before with Cotton Comes to Harlem, released in May of 70. Here were the original black exploitation actors, 
football players, Jim Brown on the right and Fred the Hammer Williamson to his right. And who's that second from the left? That is, yes, Jim Kelly, who would later be in Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee's real debut film in America in 73. And at the end, of course, I saved the best for laugh, Richard Roundtree in Shaft. Um, a year after Con Comes to Harlem, May of 71, you get Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, a defining album of, you know, where the Black movement was in the dawn of the 1970s. In comics, Neil was really the only realistic drawer of the Black experience, you know, whether he had photographic reference for this, but he knew when to cartoon and exaggerate. These images were from the famous Green Lantern, Green Arrow drug stories. And then, of course, you've got his late 1971 creation um, of the first a non-white Green Lantern, John Stewart. But when you read dialogue like this, written by Denny O'Neill, yeah, it sounds like it could have been written uh, in the recent presidential campaign by he who shall not be named. But, you know, this issue came out in October of 71, a couple months after that in human story. And literally three days after this Black John, uh, Green Lantern debuted, Sly and the Family Stone released the classic, there's a riot going on. So these issues were floating around in 1971 when Neil Adams told this story. There's Report and Zinks. And then you get Neil's fourth and final issue of the Inhumans with this cover. Nice action shot again, so much type crowding in Neil's art. But look at this page from my sketchbook where Neil says, this is a good example of how a good drawing can be turned into a bad cover. Well, you be the judge, but there it is. And once again, while this might be considered a great splash page, the more you look at Verporten's heavy-handed inks, you can only imagine with tears what Tom Palmer might have inked of that foreshortened hand in the foreground. But, you know, we have to, you know, take what we get. And how about that pretty nice Thor panel? which in my sketchbook looks like this with Neil saying, and a good example of how Thor can be sexy. Hello. But yeah, that's how Adam felt about Thor. So after his Inhumans run ended, again, Roy Thomas, the idea of, uh, I'm sorry, Neil's commitment to doing the Avengers sprang up and it started with this particular cover. Neil didn't draw the interior. This is September of 1971, which means it came out in the summer. But it was pretty great cover where we got to see Neil's take again on a Thor, Iron Man, beautiful. He drew a great Captain America. Now, Neil came on board after Roy Thomas had begun what became known as the Cree Skrull War. Again, folks, I'm not taking the time on this webinar to go into the details, but suffice it to say, this was a war between the two alien races in the Marvel Universe, the Crees and the Skrull. And Roy Thomas, in the previous issues illustrated by Sal Buscema, as you can see, credit here on a modern reprint. This was the initial idea of a war that Thomas had started, but again, did not know where it was going. 
Neil took it over, and just like they worked together on the X-Men, he made it his own. He told the Kree scroll war the way he wanted to tell it, and Roy Thomas, like he had done with X-Men, again, did the dialogue. There's the black and white original art. No more John Verporten. Again, either Neil inked these covers or Palmer inked them. But he definitely inked the interior. This one, all his Avengers, as I'm going to show you, feel like movies on paper, folks. Um, and Neil, in a sense, is this great movie director taking you through his story with Thomas writing the dialogue and narration. It's one of the few pages we have, even though it's in a degenerated form of what Neil's tight pencils look like that neither he nor Tom Palmer kept copies of. And this is all we have. But man, you can see how much Palmer, and once again, either he or Neil colored these. But right away, what a dramatic beginning. Turn the page. Notice we're no more diagonal X-Men panels. Neil, I think, got a lot of flack for that. And when he returned to Marvel with his Avengers run, you can see that he chose where and when to do diagonals. But there's a lot of very clear storytelling with just some incredibly beautiful drawing. Another page, we have this degenerated type pencil of, but man, you can see where he's numerating the word balloons because he's got notes written on another piece of paper for Roy Thomas to tell him what's going on and ideas for the dialogue. And that's how it would look approximately inked by Palmer. Great Iron Man. That's one of the iconic Iron Man drawings. And what else does Neil bring back that he loved from Jack Kirby's earliest run at Marvel? Yes, 1962. The first X-Men with that funky helmet that Neil brought back as well and made it cool. And then he has Ant-Man shrink down and go into the Vision's body, which came from the 1966 film that Neil knew about, claimed he didn't see until later. But yes, in Fantastic Voyage, they go into this tiny ship. And that's exactly what happens in one of Neil's greatest double-page spreads, the intense close-up of the vision with Ant-Man about to go into his body via his mouth. A great spread like this started out on a single eight and a half by 11 piece of Xerox paper with Neil's black and white pencils or felt tip drawings. But this is the best version I have to show you. So folks, you're looking at an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that represents two double page spreads, four pages of comic art. If you take the top half of the eight and a half by 11, that's the double page spread. The bottom half, are the next two pages of story. So let's take a look. Again, we unfortunately don't have the next stage of this would be Neil's tight pencil. We only have Tom Palmer's black and white inks. And then of course, the coloring. Look at this Twitter feed by Mike Mignola. Uh, after Neil passed away. Now, Mignola is famous for his Hellboy character. He's one of the modern masters of comic art, but look at what he says about Neil, especially in the second paragraph. I was a Marvel-only kid, so I entirely missed out on so much of the groundbreaking stuff Neil did on books like Batman and Green Lantern. But he did those couple issues of The Avengers one in particular knocked me for a loop. The one where Ant-Man goes down the Vision's throat and looks around in there. That one was just so different than anything else I was looking at back then. 
but I don't think it was possible to look at his work and not bring something away from it. Even it was just the knowledge of what was possible. That is how art and storytelling like this. And Neil said himself, I'm a storyteller. Art is the facility I use to tell the story. So remember, folks, this is not Roy Thomas's story. This is Neil Adams that begins on eight and a half by 11 pieces of Xerox paper like this. Let's take a look at the next two pages. So Neil would, in a sense, blow up each page like this, do a tight pencil. We don't have the tight pencil. All we have is the inked Palmer page, even in low resolution, that I'm laying over Neil's thumbnails to show you how much of the thumbnail and its original energy and composition remain in the finished two pages. And when I say Neil made the X-Men helmet look cool, look at that bottom right panel. And then you get to this mini masterpiece. Again, it feels like with Neil's Avengers work, you were watching a movie unfold. But folks, this is 1971. They're not making superhero movies, but Neil's doing a superhero movie on paper. And it starts with this, what is again, a quarter page of a thumbnail of an eight and a half by 11 page. One of the few pages we have of an approximation of Neil's tight pencil. Folks, that's pretty abstract. And yet every pencil line is there if you can imagine the original pristine pencil that Tom Palmer was given, that enabled him to ink it so precisely and beautifully like this. I mean, folks, that's a difficult drawing to ink. But Palmer himself said he was inspired. He was a young newcomer to comics at that point. And seeing art like this blew him away as well and inspired him. Once again, folks, no diagonal layouts. Because Adams, the great storyteller, is inside an alien body, he's letting the art within the panels give you the dynamics. And there's an approximation of Palmer's inks and application of Zipatone to get the effects in the finished art. I mean, you really sense through Palmer's use of Zipatone and the like, the dimension, the chromeness of the Ant-Man's helmet. And again, one of the few examples we have of Neil's tight pencils with his margin notes for Roy Thomas and his dialogue. And the finished beautiful page. Look at the beautiful coloring in the top panel. I mean, again, beautiful coloring all around. Ah, one of the great shots of the Avengers in a group. Each figure is worth studying, but man, look at the thumbnail. Again, folks, that's about a quarter of an eight and a half by 11 page. Now, I'm showing you a more degenerated version because it's the only version we have of that great Iron Man head that made it to the finish looking like that. Again, beautiful links by Palmer, great coloring. Another great Avengers group shot would be this cover of their next issue together, 94. Again, Neil's... Marvel covers are not great because look at all that type and how they switch. But this was happening at DC at the time as well. All this crowding in. Neil's best covers are full bleed, as they say. This issue happened to be about the incredible number of full page images. Not only the great splash page, but how about this chapter page? 
with Neil doing an approximation. Now, only somebody that studies photographs of fisheye lenses would be able to make a drawing approximate that effect. But look at how Neil has it in the thumbnail, a quarter of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And the finished art. Another full page image. See, Neil drew explosions, man. I mean, it's not a curvy explosion, it's a Neil explosion, but it's got the power. Now, remember that explosion inked by Verporten? And I said, oh, can you imagine what Tom Palmer might have done with this? Well, look at what Tom Palmer did with this explosion. And again, just some beautiful coloring. Another incredible full page from this issue. The man droids. And some nice zip tone by Palmer in the foreground to give the lead man droid its beautiful graphic look. A nice Avengers fighting page. Captain America throwing the shield. How about Iron Man in those skates? Yeah, baby. And then you get the final page. Not only with some great gymnastics by Neil of Iron Man. How about the Palmer inked page? And yes, of course, we have to talk about the drama of the final panel. Is that? Yes. We'll talk about it in the next issue. Now, this cover does not look like Neil to me. That looks like John Buscema, inked by Palmer. So once again, you know, Neil was losing visual interest in the covers, but you know, when they talk about great splash pages in comic book history, pun intended, here is Triton making a splash literally out of the water onto the dock. And this has to be considered not only one of Neil's greatest splash pages, but one of the greatest splash pages in comic book history for its intense drama. I mean, it was all there in the thumbnail sketch, a quarter of a page big. Look at what Neil says. What is it about some drawings that captures so much attention? The final art wasn't used as a poster or to promote the comic book in any way. But so many artists and others have reminded me of the impact this drawing had on them. I mean, this drawing has transcended it's comic book original version. Yeah, that exists. And I mean, Eric Larson's Savage Dragon <laughs> totally comes out of, you know, him being inspired by this. As great as that splash page was, how about this cinematic storytelling by Neil with very little narration by Thomas. We're lucky to once again have the thumbnail. This is a quarter page big, folks. Split up. But you can see, we don't have the tight pencil, but we've got Palmer's inks. But it was all there in the thumbnail. This again feels like you're watching a movie of the Avengers. Remember that phrase, a movie of the Avengers. We do have the incredible gestural thumbnail. You know, if we were teaching an art class, folks, this is where young artists need to pay attention to why you do thumbnails. This is a quarter page of an eight and a half by 11. And it was all there. Tom Palmer sinks. And the finish. This page, it had a recap. Neil was bringing his aborted and human storyline over into the Avengers. So he was really making this Kree Skull War 
of, of an, an incredible epic. And look at this group shot of the Avengers with a vision, very Batman-like in the background. But it was all there in the thumbnail, folks, a quarter page wide of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. If only we had the in-between tightly penciled stage. How about this page with that great vision figure? Well, it's degenerated, but this is the tiny thumbnail of that figure by Neil. This is maybe two inches tall. I don't know, maybe three. But you can see the, the initial gesture is captured in the finished art. Now, here's another eight and a half by 11 piece of paper representing four pages of this inhuman story. The top half are two pages. The bottom half are the next two pages. So let's take a look at this bottom half. We don't have Neil's tight pencil. We don't have Tom Palmer's ink. But you can see in the finished art how much of that original tiny thumbnail is there in the finish. And how about the beautiful monochromatic coloring by either Palmer or Adams that end up making this. Great fight scene. And this stylized image, only Neil could pull off that type of dramatic lighting and commit that much black. And it ends on a truly high note with this great shot of the Avengers in a group. And then we get this shot of the Avengers in a group, the cover of the next issue, 96. Ah, maybe Neo's greatest issue of the Avengers. This one literally feels like you're watching a widescreen cinematic film. Let's study this page a little more. I mean, Neil drawing the Avengers in full figure like that in his trait, you feel the heft of those figures. Ah, uh, again, it's Neil saying, I want it as dramatic as Kirby, but more realistic, but I don't want to sacrifice the dynamics. And there's Palmer's inks. And again, the, the beauty of great coloring. Old school Bende dot coloring by either Palmer or Adams. Beautiful. And like I said, we feel like we're watching a movie. In the first 10 pages of this Avengers issue, maybe Neil's pinnacle of his Marvel works to date. Great group shot. I always felt this page of the invading alien armada of the Skrulls was Neil doing his hat tip to what Kirby had done in 1968 on his famous Mangog epic. And those were the wanderers that were evading Galactus, uh, however the story, Rag, uh, no, Mangog or whatever. But you can see Neil doing it his way. And I'm showing you this page really just because of that cool shot of Captain America leaping as only Neil could draw that dramatic figure. And anytime there was one panel with that many Avengers in it was cause to celebrate. Again, you feel like you're watching a movie as you go through these incredible panels. And then you turn the page and I'm showing you this page this way to give you the feeling of, you could feel the torque of Iron Man's body. You can feel the rush of the foreign vision figures.
in this page, that great close-up of Thor. And the climax. Now, folks, this is a trademark example of Neil's mixing of realism with the dynamics of comic art. There is the best approximation of Palmer's inks, but it had to be there in the pencils, folks. But that is mastery of both realism, exaggeration, dynamism. Great lettering, by the way. And then how about the coloring? The stylized yellows and browns and oranges. I mean, again, it's either Tom Palmer or Neil Adams. How about that great shot of Iron Man? Uh, again, anytime you had a group shot, Neil really loved drawing Thor because he always put Thor in the foreground. And this would be the last page of what would be Neil's last Avengers page. We didn't know it at the time. When we got the next issue, it was still Roy Thomas and Tom Palmer, but it was John Buscema taking over and finishing the Kree Skrull War. The whole reason why Neil dropped out is better read in my Marvel years. It's too much to go into. But suffice it to say that those four issues of the Avengers that Neil did, that felt like you were watching a movie, is why decades later, there was an Avengers to be made movies of. Because I guarantee you these stories were read and loved by the Spielbergs and the Lucases and the makers of today's modern Marvel cinematic triumphs. Look at what Neil said in my article at the end. When the work, meaning his Marvel work was good, it was great. And the work changed the face of Marvel to that extent. Look at the X-Men. It was in the X-Men that the impact was felt because it was a continuity that lasted a good 10 issues. And you could look at the run of it and say, this is what the X-Men can become. The Avengers was a small, bright star that dimmed and went away. It's too bad. I can't have a conversation with Marvel fans without the subject of finishing the Kree Skull War coming up. Why didn't I finish it? Or will I ever finish it? It rankles me because I know it would have been great, and I know they were disappointed, and I feel like I let them down. If I had finished that war, there's a suspicion that the Avengers could have been as strong and as powerful as the X-Men. I know it could have and would have been. I feel in some ways that my work with Marvel is sort of an unfinished symphony that everybody would have enjoyed had we finished it. Had he finished the Marvel years as I'm finishing this memorial webinar Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to my website, arlenschumer.com, you can see subpages like my comic book history page, which has information about my book that you can get a sign and sketched in by me hardcover copy of. The Neil chapter has a bunch of X-Men images and spreads that I'm very proud of, like this one of the images you've seen in this webinar. Look at how I compare and contrast what he did at Dead Man in 1968 and then a year later in the infamous or famous X-Men page. And then there's this double page spread of two of Neil's greatest X-Men double page spreads comparing the color hold covers and Neil's panel design. I run a Facebook group dedicated to the Silver Age itself a separate one on just Jack Kirby's work and one, of course, on Neil Adams' work, Neil Adams' almanac. He was the artist that influenced me and literally a whole generation to do what we do creatively. I do comic book art, but for advertising and editorial usage. One of my specialties is keeping the photographic likeness of real people, but turning them into superheroes. 
My site is linked to the commercial site T Public, where you can get over 125 of my illustrations in any kind of knickknack, ego, thingamabob application you could think of. So support your local freelance artists. My visual lectures and webinars page linked to my YouTube channel and my Vimeo channel, which house videos of my recent webinars. My, my Vimeo channel has all of the webinars that the YouTube lawyers kicked off because they use copyrighted material like music, uh, Bruce Springsteen and Twilight Zone and James Bond. But my YouTube channel has, you can see, in chronological order from top to bottom, my recent Neil Adams Memorial webinars and others that I've done on not just comics, but a whole range of pop culture subjects. In terms of my Neil Memorial webinars, next week in chronological order, we get into the late seventies and Superman versus Muhammad Ali. But before this was published in 78, the previous 10 years, Neil did a significant body of Superman art, not stories, but covers and other collateral images that would be crowned with what Neil thought was his greatest comic art achievement. So folks, that's next week, same bat time, same bat channel. If you go to the events blog page, I always show what's coming up and what I've done with all the URL links you'll need. So thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this webinar, and I hope to see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks for attending this presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. And please remember to click the subscribe or follow button on your platform screen to be notified of all of my upcoming pop culture presentations. And visit my website, arlenschumer.com to sign up for my newsletter too. Until next time, I'm Arlen Schumer. Bye-bye.